This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 208, recorded on November 19th, 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. This is Thanksgiving week here in the United States, and I have a special episode for you. I have a special guest in studio. He's the chief of the cellular biology section in the Laboratory of Viral Diseases at the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH, John Udell. Welcome to TWIV, John. Thank you, Vince. Pleasure to be here. Long time listener, big fan. <laughs> and a former radio voice, right? A, the voice of Princeton Sports. What year would that be? 1974 to 75. The, and also color for several years before that, the single worst era in Princeton football history. <laughs> yes. Even losing to Cornell. It's bad. It's very bad. Very bad. But the basketball team was very good. In fact, uh-huh. we won the NIT. When that was something, before the mm-hmm. NCAA was everything. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I got to broadcast from Madison Square Garden. That's pretty cool. It was cool. Can we find recordings of that archive somewhere? Oh, Probably in not, my right? basement. Uh, yeah, if my wife would let me go down there, are, rummage are, through. Those are pre-internet days. They are. Because today everybody, yes. everything would be online. But so we, we had an audience numbering in the tens. Eh. Yeah. My brother used to be sports information director for St. John's. Oh. So he was often at the garden. Yeah. Sitting with the radio team and giving them uh-huh. information. With Louis Carnesecca was Carnesecca the coach? Carnesecca was yeah. the coach at the time. Yeah. yeah. Good basketball. Many, many years ago. Yeah. So you were an undergrad at Princeton at this time, right? I was. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Eastchester, not far from here, about 20 miles from here, just across up the border. In, uh, yeah, just north of the Bronx. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, decided to go to, where'd you go to high school? Bronx Science? No, I went to a terrible high school called Tuckahoe High School, where <laughs> I had possibly the worst science education possible in the New York suburbs at that time, uh-huh. and became a scientist despite uh, my, my early education. Yeah, went to Princeton a- thinking I should be a history major. Uh-huh. And then I took one history course, and I realized there was a, no objective reality, <laughs> that whoever wrote the best essay got to say what the truth was, and I thought, hmm. That's not for me. At that time, I naively thought I wanted to be a doctor, of all things, a general practitioner. Uh-huh. And I was just completely wrong. Mm-hmm. This is why the American system is so good. A kid can then figure out in life what they need to do. So out of Princeton, you wanted to be a doctor. Where I did. did. You, where did you go? So I went to Penn. Okay. Uh, Princeton made me do a undergraduate research thesis. I wound up randomly in Arnie Levine's lab. He was an extremely good mentor. Mm-hmm. I also lucked into having Art Levinson. Right. who later became CEO of Genentech as a graduate student in the lab, who took me under his wing. Wow. And uh, we would have fabulous discussions. And unbeknownst to me, I loved science. Mm-hmm. And I did uh, my first experiments, and they were all artifacts, but I got, as I was describing in the last hour to the kids, I got the thrill of thinking I had discovered something. Mm-hmm. And for most of us, that's the hook. That's you right. Know, that's the hook. That's we it. do an experiment, you discover something, you're alone at night in the lab, and you get this feeling that you're the first person alive to know something. Right. And that is amazing. That, that's why having an opportunity to do research as an undergrad is important, right? Otherwise, you'd never know that. It, it is. And Princeton had, it was a fabulous education. I mean, incredibly rigorous and good. Some advice I would give to undergraduates, even though they'll think it's stupid and a waste of their time and it's difficult, is take thermodynamics. <laughs> we were forced to take it as biochem right. majors. And uh, as a working scientist, that is the single most valuable set of information I got as an undergraduate. I mm-hmm. use that way of thinking every day. I'm and sure. I am not a structural person. Mm-hmm. So, and kids today barely learn law of mass action. Absolutely. You know? So I, Princeton Absolutely. gave us a fabulous uh, education. And I became a scientist despite myself. What was your major? I was a biochemistry okay. major. Yeah, I wound up in biochemistry because that was the easiest route, I thought, to medical school. But you learn good things in biochem. Yeah, it's a tremendous background. We often get questions from listeners about who are undergrads, and they say, what should I major in to be a virologist or a microbiologist? Biochem is one of the things. Biochem is good. Chemistry, chemistry is good. Chemistry is good. Chemistry is good. Yeah. You need a background, a base. And 
Uh, again, thermodynamics to me is very, very important. What would you say if someone was a physics major? Would that be okay? Yeah. The problem with physics majors is they, they tend to be too smart to be biologists. <laughs> so they want to be able to figure out everything on a piece of paper. I see. And I see. as we just talked about for the last hour and a half, uh, doing experiments is everything in biology. Mm. You have to get there and, and do experiments and then let right. nature teach you what you don't know. You can't in biology predict the coolest things. I mean, you have to let serendipity work. Right. Have to. So you went on to a Penn. Yes. MD, PhD program. Right. Well, I was originally just an MD, and Penn was wise enough to leave ah, a few slots open. Okay. And after a few weeks in medical school, that's all it took, I realized I did not really want to be a doctor mm -hmm. in the end. And so Penn took me, and Penn had a fabulous system back then. They had an attitude that as a, as a scientist, you should figure out for yourself what you need to know. Mm. They treated you like an adult. So I managed to get through the whole program taking only three graduate school courses. Uh, part of that was because Princeton was such a good undergraduate mm. education. Wow. Arnie Levine taught a virology course back then, which was unusual. So I took a graduate level mm -hmm. virology course. And Arnie's lab was spectacular, and he was an amazingly good professor as well. I still have the notes from his virology class, virology 501 that I look at. He was, Arnie was, was really very, very mm. good. Lynn Enquist teaches that course now. Yeah, Lynn is equally spectacular, and I was just lauding the book that, that you guys wrote. Uh, Lynn is also, I know, an outstanding teacher, very insightful. Yeah. So you remained an MD, though, at, at Penn, right? Well, uh, it was, they let me graduate with only 13 months of clinical uh -huh. uh, why, why courses. Would, why would they do that? Um, Penn was famous for... For producing MDs who didn't know much medicine, but who were just uh -huh. pretty good scientists, potentially. And they just thought it was okay. Uh, and there was this sort of tacit agreement with the dean mm -hmm. that you would never touch a human being. <laughs> <laughs> that I had no problems. It sounds like the agreement Richard Axel had when he was yeah. MD. There's a generation, my generation, <laughs> there are many of us who, who went through medical school realizing they were really destined for science. Yeah. And as, as I was telling the kids, you know, in the last hour when I was giving the talk, um, medicine is a very good background in systems biology. Mm -hmm. You just learn a whole bunch of things that, that stick in your brain that are useful for the rest of your career. And you're not, I never wrote a prescription. I never really treated a patient. You know, I was always helping a resident. But you get a feeling for what diseases are. You certainly mm -hmm. develop empathy for people, um, for, for what, the, what, what the diseases are and you get a feeling for how everything works together, which, you know, we call systems biology now, sure. basically. Yeah. You know, how cells work and how the cells communicate. And I, I must also add that when I was at Penn, the immunology there, which is great, again, was a terrific, terrific program mm. led by very dedicated peace people, Darcy Wilson, Norman Kleinman, Will Silvers. I mean, it was just, there was this faculty, John Sprenth. It was just a great faculty. They treated us like adults. They treated us like young colleagues. Right, not yeah, as yeah. students. We were first name basis, and uh, they judged whether you were good enough in your first year. And if you were, you were in the club. And it was a completely different system. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was telling the kids, no one believes us, our generation, that you used to be able to go straight from graduate school to a tenure track job. Yeah. Right. And if you did a postdoc, often it was just a year or two or three, three max. Right. right. And all of us got our careers started when we were even before thirty. Yeah. Uh, many people in their in their you know late twenties. What did you do as a PhD student? Um, so my PhD, I just I got thrown out of one lab, basically. <laughs> it's just luck has followed me my whole career. And he suggested I might work with a former postdoc of his named Walter Gerhardt, mm -hmm. who was the first guy to make monoclonal antibodies to viruses. Right. So I walked in. I was his second student, uh, his first one to graduate. And uh, just as a kid in a candy shop. Yeah. And Walter taught me a huge uh, about science, a lot, a huge amount about science. We worked together at first, and then he just basically let me be on my own. And um, I participated in something that Walter had started, which was generating uh, the technology for epitope mapping based on using monoclonal antibodies to select escape mutants. Right for flu, right? For flu. Yeah. So we started with flu in my first paper. Uh, was, was showing the frequency of, of escape mutants. So I've mm -hmm. always been very sort of quantitative. And I that's a really cool number. I remember that work. I was in a Palazzi lab at the time working on flu. And he showed me, he said, look, this is how you can figure out mutation frequencies using monoclonals. Yeah, yeah. we were just, it was great. Yeah. Uh, it was a great experience. And in fact, Peter has always been a great uh, support in my career. Peter was my external uh, thesis examiner and 
Peter and Jerry and Ed, Jerry Shulman and Ed Kilburn have were always incredibly generous with with their reagents. Right. So, one of the early papers I was on, where I first started collaborating with Jack Benick, we provided the first evidence that internal proteins were recognized by CD8s against lytic viruses like flu, and that work was only possible because Peter sent us this entire panel. Of, of reassortant viruses that right. Mike Lubeck had made. Right. And Peter didn't want to be on the paper. It just, Peter taught me, you be generous in your career. Mm. And what I learned from Mount Sinai was, particularly in virology, if you have made a virus and you published it, it is a tremendous honor that other people want it, and you give it to them without any strings attached. And Peter and, and Jerry and Ed taught me that. Yeah. yeah. I wish everyone felt that way. Hello. <laughs> yeah, hello. We're back <laughs> working on flu now and getting, getting viruses out of people. It's yeah. almost impossible, you know, particularly clinical isolates. And yeah. this is not good. No, right? you're, as you said today, you're not working for yourself. You're not. What science is, in the end, is a communal exercise. And we are all working together. And in fact, people have a completely wrong attitude in their fields, most people. They view, if a competitor does good work, they view that as a threat. Right. Wrong. <laughs> if a competitor does good work, it rises the whole field. Of course. And makes everyone's work that much more interesting and valuable. Right. So if your competitor has a great paper, A, when you're reviewing it, you should be as positive as possible. Uh, and B, you should realize it is helping your career and not hindering it. Right? So another lesson that, that young scientists need to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what did you do as a postdoc after? Or did you do a postdoc? So I did a one-year postdoc with Walter. Basically, I just got more money. You stayed in the same lab. <laughs> yeah, okay. my wife was finishing a pediatric um, um, residency at Children's Hospital, okay. so we stayed in Philly. And then she went to Great Ormond Street in London to do a fellowship, and I was David Lane's first postdoc. Mm -hmm. David was one. Uh, coincidentally, it wasn't really, it was, again, random. David, along with Arnie, co-discovered P53. Mm -hmm. So I was the first postdoc in David's lab, and he had a very small lab at that time. A couple of graduate students, me, a technician. Mm -hmm. And uh, David, very, very smart guy. That was a blast. Great. So that was a year in London. Uh, my wife got pregnant. Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, nice to have a baby at home. And so we came back, and uh, Wistar just took me back, basically, mm -hmm. as an assistant professor. That's where you'd been, right? Yeah, so that, that's probably a mistake. You know, if you go back to where you train, they always think you're a first-year graduate student. Yeah, yeah. And they treat you that way. But um, still, uh, the science was great. Walter was still doing uh, great things. Uh, and I was back in that environment. I was working on flu, and that's where Jack and I really started working very closely together. Jack and I, Jack got hold of the first recombinant viruses that Bernie Moss had made, the recombinant mm -hmm. vaccinia viruses, uh, expressing in the end each individual, excuse me, flu gene segment. Jeff Smith had made them. That's when Jeff was launching this very impressive career as a postdoc with Bernie. Uh, and Jack and I used those viruses with Bernie and, and Jeff to map the CD8 response to, uh, to mm. flu. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was working, I, I was teaching myself to become a cell biologist from what I had started to learn with, uh, with, with, at David, in David Lane's lab. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started working on hemagglutinin and biogenesis. And first four years, uh, it was me and a technician. And I think one of the big mistakes that assistant professors make when they get their own labs is they stop working in the lab and they start hiring students. Mm -hmm. And students are hit or miss. And your two best hands for a long time are your own. And I wasn't thinking about any of this stuff. It was all just sort of random, but it turned out to be very useful. Because yeah. I was good in the lab. I just, sheer, by sheer luck, hired an extremely good technician named Amy Yellen, who became a very good graduate student and then a great postdoc. With, ironically, my first postdoc, hired her as a postdoc, so <laughs> the chain. And we were extremely productive. The two of uh -huh. us, I think, were on... 14 papers in four years. Uh, some ourselves and a lot in collaboration with other people yeah. and with, with Jack. And so for the first four years, uh, I worked really, really hard in the lab myself. And uh, I think that's a really good way to start your career. Well, there are some of us in the era that you and I uh, trained, which starting our jobs in the early 80s, right? It was a time when uh, you could not be so great in the lab and still end up as a PI. That's true. And so those people, and I know many of them, immediately stopped working and hired other people to do Yeah, work. they had to do that. Right. And that's a tricky transition. Yeah. And there are some people who need that. But most people, including as you're alluding to, most people today, they're good. Yes, today you have to work yeah. in the lab. And, and yeah. not just that. I mean, 
if you're good in the lab, that's what you enjoy the most. Yeah. And yeah. it's fun <laughs> to make discoveries vicariously through your people mm-hmm. and to help and to be there. But it is not the same no. as doing it yourself. There's that kick of looking in the microscope or getting the counts or right. looking right. at the hemagglutination and seeing the discovery and then realizing what it means for yourself. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I loved working in the lab. And so I also, my first 10 years here, I was in the lab. And I had people coming in, but I was always in there yeah. because I love to do science. And, and not just that. You, you have a much better take on, on what's going wrong in the lab. You know what reagents are good. You know what machines are working. You know how people are working well together. So the worst thing that PIs can do is barricade themselves in the office. Yeah, And, and you know, one of the terrible yeah. things about some of these beautiful new buildings is when they put the scientists, uh, they put the offices not adjacent to the lab, Right. You just you want your yeah. office door, if possible, to open onto the lab, so you really know what's going on, yeah. and people have yeah. no barriers to walking in with today's great result. Yep, I agree. And I was for my first ten years, I had my office in the lab, but now mine is down the hall. And when we moved here, I really yeah. didn't like it. Yeah, you missed it. I yeah. did because I know it was a barrier for people to walk. It is. Here. Jack had a time yeah. when he didn't have to walk far, but just out of the lab to get to his office, and he did not like that. You know, there are certain people who will not have that as a as an impediment to them. But then there are many others who will, and they they need your attention more than yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. No, it still works. It, it's just not yeah. as optimal. Yeah. It still works. So you spent 15 years at the Wistar, is that right? Well, all, no, all told it was uh, 10 years in Philly. Uh, okay. 11-year calendar and one year in London. And then in 19, um, 1987, Bernie recruited us to... Uh, to NIAID, it was just when Tony Fauci had gotten the first HIV money, and mm-hmm. they were expanding. And they recruited us to work part-time on HIV and on the rest on CD8s, because Tony had the wisdom of seeing that biology is biology. And if mm-hmm. we could work out the rules of how CD8 T-cells work in mice for flu or vaccinia, that this would be useful for people working on HIV and other viruses. Okay. And one of the great things about having Tony Fauci as director is that he really gets the importance of basic research. Uh, he knows that for many translational discoveries, they are going to bubble the way, bubble, bubble through from the uh, from the basic research, uh, and that you need all kinds of scientists to, to to make a successful research enterprise to do something practically in the end. Now, the uh, the talk you alluded to a few times already, yeah, it's a talk that you just gave a bunch of students and postdocs here. Uh, and you call it How to Succeed in Science Without Really Trying. Correct. And they loved it. Yeah. it's. I think it's a summary of what you've learned in, in your whole career about it's, how to do science and how to get into it. How did, how did you start? You said you've given 90 of these. Right? About 90. You know, I just added them up. How did uh, this start? It started as um, students in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, inviting me to give a keynote lecture at, at a research day that they had. And I just thought this was 10 years ago. Even 10 years ago, it was harder being a scientist. I thought they could use a little bit of advice. Mm-hmm. So I gave them about 30 minutes of advice. It was put pretty well received, and I thought, this is useful. Mm-hmm. Uh, young scientists could use this, some of the practical things they can use in terms of how to do experiments, how to think about data, a little bit of philosophy of science, but, but particularly where I start off and I just thank them for, for becoming scientists because it is so important to society and because they get so little positive feedback once they get into the career. I mean, mm-hmm. to me, this is about the single most important thing we do in society is we do science. Um, we have 7 billion people on this planet and there is no going back. We need more technology and not less. Technology causes problems for sure, but technology is also the solution. And we need our best and brightest young minds in science. We need them. And one of the good trends of Wall Street crashing over the last three years is that many of these terrific minds that would have gone to Wall Street, in the end we find out to basically bankrupt America by basically using financial tricks to take money uh, from, from many to the few, these people now are coming to graduate school. And I think this is, this is the one good trend of having this um, difficult economic times. We're really, I think, the quality of students, everyone tells me, is, is better mm. now, which is a good thing. Uh, and one of the reasons we have to tell them how important it is is because one of the other messages that I give is that it's a very difficult career. It's a career where you don't really get a full-time job until you're almost 40 years old. And at this point, let me just add, because uh, this is important, 
that the opinions I'm expressing here are my own personal opinions. <laughs> These are not the opinions of NIAID or NIH or the U.S. government. These are my own personal opinions. The government, they may agree with me, they may not, whatever. These are my personal opinions, what I've seen. Noted. Yeah, noted. So just in case anyone's freaking out out there, this is not the government speaking, this is me and a nobody in the government uh, who happens to love working for the federal government and is quite proud to be a, a federal employee. But um, I think we really have to address these career issues. And so I want to thank the kids for doing it. And at the same time, I'm apologetic for why the career is so difficult and why it pays so poorly until they get their first real job as an assistant professor. It's, it's interesting. You, uh, you mentioned that you don't get your first job until you're 40 now. Yeah, I think on average it's something like 37 and a half, 38. And you and I, I, I was 29, you were 30. I was 29. And Steve Goff, who was in the audience, was 30 as well. Yeah, Jack was 28 or 27, Jack Benick, the guy I work with, and most of my friends were in their 20s. So when, why, why has it changed so much? Um, I think we're exploiting young people. I think it's convenient for us to have senior people in the lab as postdocs mm -hmm. who are good, and we can just call them trainees, even though they're not really, even though they're the most productive members of the lab. And to be honest, not everybody is ready to be a PI when mm -hmm. they come out of their PhD. Some kids are. The very best ones are. Some not. Um, and I think it's also convenient for us to call them trainees so we can pay them much less money than they deserve. Uh, I think what we pay postdocs, it's better now than it was, but I, th I still think it's scandalous. People spend six, seven years in graduate school to make less money than they would make on average just coming out of college and entering the labor force. And I just don't think this is right. Especially for a, a field that you think is essential for the, the We all agree that it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we all agree, agree that it is. I totally agree. And with every scientist does. And so I think we just have to start. We, you know, this is just America. We want something for nothing. Yeah. Right, and scientists are no exception. We want we want the best and brightest to do science, but we don't want to pay them. And and one of the women in the audience asked, basically, well, how am I supposed to be a normal woman and have a family mm -hmm. and have children? And, and the answer is, it's really really hard. We don't pay them enough, and we do nothing to pay for um, childcare. Uh, in Bethesda, it's something like close to twenty five thousand dollars a year per kid for daycare. Mm. You know, after taxes, that's almost your whole salary. Uh, it's just, it's not working. And we're asking too much of people. But there are, are people who would say it, it has worked for so many years. Why change it? So what do you say to them? It's just, it's, it's you know, I, I think the story is apocryphal. Everyone cites the, the frog not jumping out of the pot where you gradually raise the temperature. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently they will very quickly, right? But it, it's that sort of phenomenon where it's gotten worse by worse over the last 20 years. And the National Academy has been studying this over the last 15 years and coming up with one beautiful report documenting the problems, suggesting creative solutions, and they basically get ignored. Mm. I think Shirley Tillman has had two reports now yeah. that are just, they're, they're terrific that Shirley has chaired for the National Academy. And they cite all the problems. In 2000 or 2001, I was at a National Academy meeting and it was a postdoc in the audience just summed up perfectly what the gist of the meeting had been to that point. And then she had excellent timing, this woman. And then she paused and she said, what I just read to you was the summary of the last meeting 10 years ago. <laughs> and everyone gasped. Yeah. And her point being, we know about these problems. We have to address them. And we're not. And in fact, with this financial crisis that, that we've had in, at NIH over the last three or four years, um, things have gotten much worse. And what used to be mainly a problem for training has now extended to the entire field of science. Uh, principal investigators who are world experts in their subject are, are being tossed out, basically, into the cold, cruel world. And this is a ridiculous way to run uh, uh, any sort of profession. And, and we have to do better. We can't ask people to be scientists and expect it to be so difficult for their entire careers. It's just too competitive. Something that I didn't bring up during the talk, but it's important, is that if you put people under circumstances where their career is threatened, you will bring out the worst in people. So there's always going to be fraud in science. We are people. Mm -hmm. We're not perfect. This will always happen. But if you put people under tremendous pressure like we do today, you are just asking for it. Right? So levels of fraud yeah, uh, must be... Yeah. Have you, are you familiar with the articles by Casa de Val and yeah, Fang? Yeah, they are this? brilliant. 
And yeah. everything these guys say, I, I basically completely agree yeah. with. Yeah, we've had a lot of discussions. You have. And you guys, well, you have. To, one of the reasons I wanted to come, Vince, was that I think you guys have dealt with this issue uh, terrifically. And I think it's very important for the community to discuss these things and to really try to build some momentum. It's important we talk about it, but it's most important that we do something at the end mm. of the day, right? We yeah, have yeah. to start changing the system. It is failing. It's failing. And this is a system, this is the goose that has laid the golden egg for America. I mean, biomedical research in America has been spectacular. We have led the world. We continue to lead the world. We have provided breakthroughs that have led to many new drugs and therapies and will continue to do so. This is the golden age for science right now. This is the golden age. One has to be patient. Things do not happen overnight. One of the examples I cited during the talk was monoclonal antibodies. We all knew that these were going to have a huge impact clinically, huge impact, and they did eventually. Even something as obvious as that took 15 years to implement from the first paper uh, from Kohler and Milstein to a patient, uh, I was probably more than 15 years because that was 74. It takes 20 or 25 years for something that is obvious. Right? Today, something like more half or more of the new drugs are based on monoclonal antibodies. Mm -hmm. We have to be patient. We know this. Every scientist knows this. Deans know this, but we, we keep forgetting. We have to remind ourselves. Basic research is the goose that lays the golden egg. We have to support basic research, right? And you can't ask people to write down on a piece of paper as basic scientists what they are going to discover. The whole grant system is, is in a way ridiculous. Why you're a basic scientist, you, what your dream is to come to the lab and that afternoon, when you go home that night, you are now thinking about something you could not have dreamed of that morning. Mm. That's what we all want. If you write a grant and you do each of your specific aims, you're disappointed. You really haven't discovered something new. And um, I have argued uh, in public and in print that we really need to change the, the grant system. Uh, grant system did a very, very good job for many years. For decades, it worked very well. Uh, it worked well when funding levels were, people say, when it's above 30 or 40 percent, then every good grant is funded. We're at levels of funding now where, where it's basically random for people, where many institutes less than 10 percent. And then it gets very, very difficult, very difficult. And again, I think a model uh, for funding is a system where we are not asking people to predict what they are going to discover. We look at their track records. We look at their track records and what they've discovered. We say, what have you discovered in the last four years that we have supported you? Oh, that looks pretty good. Give us a vague idea of what you want to work on. Okay, you can have the same amount of money uh, for the next four years and then report back to me. And what do you do with a new person then? New person you hire based on promise, which you do anyway, mm -hmm. and you fund them the same way. One of the problems with new people is you, what you would like them to do out of their postdoc is something new. Uh, what we prevent them from doing is something really new because we're going to judge them based on what they've published because we need preliminary data. Yeah, sure, sure. And I think, <laughs> you know, there, there are lots of ways around this, but departments make decisions who they're going to hire anyway. Yeah. They do this based on their promise. And there's no reason we couldn't fund people based on their promise. Right? So there, there are ways to think about this. One of my colleagues at NIH, Ron Germain, has given some thought to this. And Ron, for years, has been saying, well, we can give departments money to hire new people. And if they're big enough, we can keep giving them money depending on the success rate of their ability to hire productive mm. new people. Mm. So there are ways to think about it. I don't like that model. Okay. Giving right. a department that kind of power just seems – because, you know, departments can be run by one person. They which, can be. Which isn't good. Well, there are just – I think we need new ways of thinking about how to fund people. There are two, there are two issues you're talking about. One is to re-overhaul the way we, we give out grants, and, and the other is the shortage of money. So let's, let's tackle both of them. Okay. Let me ask you first. Why – when I came into the field, 30 percent of – grant proposals that were submitted were funded. All right. And now it's about 7%. That's right. And we're talking about biomedical research grants. I have no idea what happens in physics or yeah. chem chemistry. They, they, every field has its own problems. They're all, That's they're right. All problem. They're all different. Well, so why are we at 7% now? Even We doubled the NIH budget right. uh, under Harold right. Varmus. Because there's no control over how many people are in the system. Because we're America and we believe in a capitalistic approach, which is generally good, we do not control the number of investigators. And so when there's more NIH money, deans uh, imagine new buildings, 
Holes mm. appear in grounds and skyscrapers appear, <laughs> often on borrowed money with the idea that NIH will pay back the loans off the overhead on grants. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's the idea. And so medical schools keep getting bigger. We keep hiring more people. And no matter how much money we put in, we hire more people um, than, than the, what the system can support. So we do not have a sustainable system. And that's what we have. That's what our goal has to be. But you would argue that we need more people to do science. I right? would as argue the possible. first thing is it has to be a decent career. You're way better off with half the number of people if they're twice as smart. Okay? So mm -hmm. what you really have to do is support your very best people, which I don't think we're doing now because of the random element. And I don't think we've really carefully looked at the bang for buck. How, what is the most productive lab? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're scientists, and I think it's ironic that no one has really studied quantitatively what is the most productive lab. At least I'm not aware of such studies. Right? So what should a lab be structured? Should it really be a, a pyramid where we have graduate students at the bottom with postdocs more of and very few staff scientists and technicians? That's a very difficult system to sustain because it, we were training so many people. Should it be more of a system where we have staff scientists? This is, you know, we, at NIH, we're each allowed, in my institute, each PI is allowed to have a staff scientist. Um, and it's a great system. You can hire very good, competent, ambitious people. And one of the nice parts of the system is that they are not completely permanent jobs. So uh, there's incentive for people to do a good job. And you certainly don't want a system where everyone has a permanent job because they get very static. And one of the beauties of the system we have now is that people are always flowing through. And it's, it's inefficient, it's true, but it's a huge advantage to having new people come to your lab who don't know what you're doing because they have this very useful naivete. They are not in the box that we construct around ourselves, even if we don't want to. They have new ideas. They bring new techniques. So that part of the system works really, really well. And if we have a system with a more permanent uh, employee base, we're going to have to think about creative ways of still maintaining this dynamism, which is really important. Right? There are European countries that have a very nice employment system that had yeah. nice employment yeah. systems, but the labs tended to get really stale because you'd have a group of 10 people just working with each other for 20 years. And, right, right. That, you know, it just, yeah. it's hard to keep the edge then. I mean, one of the attractions to coming into science is you have your lab and you can do what you want. Yes. Whereas if you're a staff scientist, you have to report to someone at, at some point and that takes away that. If it's a really well-run lab, mm -hmm. the staff scientist can have a lot of freedom. And, and the beauty of being a staff scientist is that all the practical day-to-day -day things that scientists have to worry about that it aren't fun, like getting the money, mm -hmm. like dealing with personnel issues, like, like teaching if you don't really like teaching, um, like being on a lot of committees, they don't have to do that. They can focus on research. And um, at NIH, we have these staff scientist positions. I think they've been really very, very successful. And you get people, you get particularly a lot of, of people who are starting their careers, who want to start a family, who don't want this complete obsession with science that it takes to be successful as a PI, right? So they can still be terrific scientists, still do a great job, but they don't have to do all these accessory roles you might mm -hmm. also have to do. Right. So these can be very good, very good jobs. And um, uh, w what we've seen in our own experience uh, at NIH is they, they, they're terrific. We have several outstanding staff scientists and I think they're happy, uh, and I think it's. I think that's a good model for the rest of the world. We pay them reasonably well as well. So you think that maybe in the current system, most universities don't have this. They staff don't scientists. Yes. Maybe we're forcing people into a PI position, and they shouldn't be. They're not made for it, so they fail, and that makes it. That's a, a problem. yeah. That's a very good way to look at it, Vince. Yeah, and you know, I, I know people are thinking, yeah, this is all pie in the sky. Where's the money? Where's the money going to come from? We have to change the funding system, right? Mm -hmm. We have to change the way we support labs. And what we have at NIH is, I think, is a very good model. We, we fund a group of people with the amount of money it takes to do the research, whatever that research is. And if it's, if it's, if it's, um, if it's a simple research, you know, simple in the sense it doesn't require a lot of animal work and mm -hmm. it can be done cheaper, it can be funded at a lower level. If it requires a lot of animals, if it requires you know, lots of transgenic mice or, or monkeys, um, we give more money. And we basically fund what the research costs. Mm -hmm. And something else which is really nice about NIH is the labs are basically at a set size. 
And so it's it's difficult in the world when you're very successful to not give in to the temptation and, and, and just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Sure. sure and sure. there are some big labs that are very productive, but what the general experience is is that once you get past a certain point, um, the productivity drops per dollar spent, right? And we can argue about what that point is, but um, uh, there is a point where where labs have too much money and a big lab is is being run basically on the talents of a few of a few very very good people, right? In NIH, we don't have that temptation. You're, you're hired. You have a certain group size. It starts out around five, and then when you get tenure, um, um, the, you you generally get two or three more people. Uh, and labs are typically under uh, around eight people in my institute, mm-hmm. something like that or less. And that's what it basically is your entire career then. Changing the uh, the way universities do their research to match NIH, well, it sounds like a good idea. I can imagine would be a nightmare to implement, right? It's not going to be easy, right? But you know, the, the, typically systems only get changed when they're just not workable anymore. Yeah, and we're there now. I think, from what I see on the outside, um, and I think we have a, a decent model for for what what a good system is. I, I really do, and I think people should look at it. And, and that's what I've argued um, uh, in, in um, essays, yeah, that this is, this is how we should do it. I wonder how that could be implemented. Could NIH, for example, say, here is a model for how we think biomedical research should be done, mm-hmm. and we're going to shift towards this in 20 years? Is that how this could Well, work? there's a pilot program that, that I've been involved in that we're trying to get going, um, where we would start to try to fund some big labs, get them to give up some of their resources in exchange for having an NIH type of system, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that if people in the community, if they're in favor of this or would like to discuss it more, if they would participate in this discussion and write to the powers that be at the various institutes that fund them and say, listen, we would really like to think about changing the system Mm -hmm. to more of a retrospective review, Perhaps this is a way to go as well, right? And, and uh, the, the, the government's role in this, I think people tend to be suspicious that if it's coming out of NIH, there must be an agenda there. There is no agenda here. You know, my agenda is that we need a better way of supporting scientists. Uh, because while my life is very good at the NIH, when I look on the outside and I see the career of extramural people, it's just too difficult. I see terrific scientists who are just struggling to maintain their labs, and I just don't think this is right. And I don't think we can ask young people to, to go into a career where this is going to be the outcome, where it's going to be so competitive that you have to worry every single renewal that your career is on the line. I mean, there's no other career like that, where you've reached your, you know, basically everybody who's getting R01 funding is a world's expert in what they study. They really are, right? They're really very good. They're at the very top of their game. And yet we're still making them compete every four years for a career, what else is like that? As, as I said in the talk, professional sports is like that, right? You're Derek Jeter, what did you hit last year if your contract is up? Okay, Derek Jeter made $16 million. <laughs> Scientists don't. Yeah. When we bomb out, well, you know, we're lucky if we have any sort of safety net to fall on. I mean, my generation will have some pension. Yeah, yeah, this right. generation won't, right? They're not even going to start getting any pension payments until they're almost 40 years old. There isn't going to be a safety net for them. Why should they do it? They shouldn't. The problem is, as I see it, that, yes, we have a big problem. It's The system is broken, but it takes people to want to change it, and you are very interested in changing it. But I just fear that there aren't many like you around who want to invest the time to do that. Yeah, that's why I'm here, <laughs> is I think you have an amazing platform. I think TWIV has changed the world. Uh, because now we can communicate with each other. Uh, people listen to you. If people are interested in this idea, uh, write to me. Write to Vince. See what we can do together. Um, the, the pilot program in NIH got started when I gave, uh, every so often, NIH and Maryland investigators give a talk to the, the immunologists. are very well organized. We have a fabulous graduate group, and we each give a talk to the group every four or five years. We just sort of round robin it. And I got a chance last year, and I started by challenging people in the audience. Ironically, intramural scientists who are, you know, we have a very nice system, but we're concerned from our colleagues. Mm-hmm. And I challenged the audience, if there's anyone out there who wants to work with me to start changing the system, let's get together. About 30 people responded. 
we got together in person and also via the internet. We had a group at Frederick who participated, who had uh, ter- terrific suggestions as well, and and we got the ball rolling there. And this is how this sort of intramural idea of changing the program started. Mm-hmm. So I think TWIV is an excellent platform for this. I, I really do. And this is why I wrote to you, which is why I wanted to come. Okay. Well, if yeah. there are people that want to help you work with you on this, they can either send us an email or we'll, we'll have a link to your website. Yes. And they'll, they'll get your email yeah. there. As yeah, well. that's right. Your uh, NIH email. Yeah, very well. easy. Judell at NIH.gov. J Y E W D E L L right N I H dot, dot gov. gov right and and just to mention I don't do we mention do we mention the essays that I had written in in no, Nature no, reviews we didn't. let's let's yeah. mention that so uh, the talk basically was boiled down into two essays that were published in two thousand eight in uh, Nature reviews in molecular and cell biology mm-hmm. which Vince you could probably have links on your I will. site I will yeah so. Yeah, uh, and, and one of the best parts of the papers uh, are these cartoons that were made by Alex Dent. Yes. And you should have links to his website as well. They're I just will. brilliant cartoons. So these are two perspectives. One is called um, How to Succeed in Science, A Concise Guide for Young Me- Biomedical Scientists, Part 1, Taking the Plunge, which talks all about, about what you need to get in and be successful in this field. And the second is uh, Part 2, Making Discoveries. Uh, and we'll put links to those in the show notes. You 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 mentioned today to this nice group of students and postdocs a, a statistic about how many of them would end up being PIs. Yeah, no one really knows this number, but I, I think it's less than 10% in the U.S. nationally. Did that go down significantly? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the evidence is mostly anecdotal, mm-hmm. but when we were students, it was not 10%. Uh, again, at, at good at good places, I mean, my class, it was probably half. Probably yours as well at Mount Sinai. Half the mm. kids got to. Uh, yeah, my class was one. So oh, was yeah. Okay, it was you. <laughs> everybody, oh, 100%. Else, everybody else failed. I had seven students in my PhD yeah. class. The other six failed. Oh, okay. So, yeah. But that's good to do it after one year. Yeah, it is. And now we kind of push it longer and we longer. We do. Yeah. yeah, but my class at Penn, more more than half the kids getting their PhDs, I think, wound up with, with a chance at having their own group. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure it was much higher than we were graduating than right, it is now. Right, right. And and no one really knows the number. I I mean you can you can glean the number if you just look at the number of postdocs. There's fifty thousand postdocs, and the number of new jobs every year is if it was a thousand. It would be a lot, right? Or two thousand. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a good ratio. So we have to cut down on the number of people we're training. We do. How do we do that? We 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 you know we'd be better off having half the number of people and treating them twice as well, right? If we can get if we could keep the smartest half. Right? Yeah. Then that would be the way to do now, it. How do we figure that out? We think we're taking the smartest people as it is, right? We're, we're losing. Right now, it's not so bad because their other careers are difficult just because econ- the economics are bad. But as the economy picks up, we're going to be losing the best people again. And, and I think what we need is that for the very best kids, there has to be some sort of guarantee that if they do everything right, they, they come to graduate school, they work hard, they make discoveries, they publish good papers, they will have a career. And I don't think they have that guarantee now. I think luck is too big an element in it, right? Th- that's what we need to attract the best people. And then we also need to pay them a reasonable salary during their postdoc years that can support a young family. When are these guys supposed to have kids? Most postdocs are in their 30s, right? Th- that is sure, the time to start having right. your family, start your family. Yeah. And we need to support them to a level that I showed the slide of when the average American buys their first house. Right, which used to be thirty-one, and now it's now it's older. But why shouldn't our guys be average Americans? Yeah, and, and they're not. You know, even in other places where they're cheaper to live than New York. I mean, New York, you're not going to buy your first house maybe ever, but <laughs> yeah, other cities. Sure, sure. But you said that um, we should, if they do everything right, they should be guaranteed a career. Are there other careers that are like yeah. that? Yeah, well, that's that's that is the good news. Is that if it's a good PhD program, and I think the training now is really much better. We are really paying much more attention about training these kids uh, as as all around people, actually, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That I think we're all doing much better at that. So the good news is is that if you're in a good program, you are learning to think logically. You are learning how to write, which is extremely important in any any interesting, high paying job, and you are learning how to present yourself uh, in giving public talks and dealing one on one. So the the good news about getting your PhD is you are getting lots of skills that will be useful in any interesting career. 
and obviously you're learning about biology as well, which there are many career paths that, that one could take as a biologist that do not involve being at the bench. Uh, in, in my lab over the years, we've had about well, 50 postdocs total, uh, about half of them, uh, 40 people who are or 40, 40, 42 who are gone. We have eight still in the lab. We, is, we so it's two labs together because uh, Jack Bennick and I run a joint lab. And about half the people are, are bench scientists, many running their own groups, and the other half are doing other things. And they've all found excellent careers. And, uh, and the good news is the half who are doing the other things are at least as happy or maybe happier uh, than the half that are doing bench science. So I think there are many things you can do that are, that are just um, interesting, fun, and important to society. Right? Besides being a PI. Absolutely. Although we do need PIs. We do need PIs, but the science education is very important. And one of the things I say during the talk is that what we're really training kids to be is, is high priests of what I call scientific methodism. Right? That's really what we're training them. And we need more of the scientific method applied to society and not less. Right? Taking evidence and making rational decisions. This is the basis of, of a healthy, productive society. And we are, this is what we are teaching you as a young scientist. How to think rationally. How to make conclusions. What is the nature of evidence? How we don't prove anything in science. How we have evidence that supports a conclusion. How knowledge is always conditional. Right? This would be much better if society could understand this, if we did a better job of communicating that. Right? So then we told people, we have this new treatment, we're not saying it proves anything. What we're saying is, we have evidence supporting the conclusion that this, whatever the conclusion is. Mm -hmm. And then people wouldn't get so upset when it turns out that's wrong. Because one of the problems that decent scientists have in communicating with the public is the public wants simple answers. And decent scientists do not give simple answers. They always couch. Because we know that we think something is solid and then lo and behold there was something we didn't know. It turns out to be not even close to what we thought it was. Sometimes it's the opposite. Mm. And that's just the way science is. Right? And that's what you get when you train in a good program. You learn what the nature of evidence is. And that makes you more effective at no matter what you're going to do in life. Right? Mm. No matter what it is, it's evidence Based And you have to appreciate what is the nature of evidence. How much do we believe things? It depends how good the evidence is. Mm. And in our case, as we were talking, it depends on how good the controls are. Right? And so much of science, then, is thinking about controls. And this is a very useful way of teaching people how to think. So would this go away towards combating the anti-science sentiment in this country that seems to be growing um, yeah, it's growing. So that's a, that's a real cultural divide there, right? It is growing among some people, including among the 1%, actually, right? There are, there are many wealthy people, well-educated, who don't, for example, believe in vaccination, right? Because they read some story on the internet that's not based on evidence, and they make a conclusion. So yes, this, this would be useful. And uh, again, you always make a mistake when you oversell something, because it will eventually come back and bite you. Eventually, right? So you tell people, okay, gene therapy, we're going to save the world with gene therapy. That's a mistake because it's never going to be as good as you think it is. And if you're just more circumspect when you discover, you say, listen, we have a new technique. It's very promising. We think in the end we'll be able to treat lots of disease, but we're not sure. And you're going to have to be patient. It could take 100 years. You're just going to have to wait. This would be much more useful, right? And, and to educate our societies, you know, our scientific societies that talk to Congress, yeah, that this is the way you should talk to them, and to educate Congress that they have to be patient, that things don't happen overnight, that things like monoclonal antibodies still took 20 years to, to make something useful. And this, I think, is one of the things we don't communicate. And it starts in science education in school, where you are taught there are facts, and all of us who have written chapters for textbooks, and you've written one of the best textbooks I've ever read, we all know it's very difficult because you know every sentence you write, mm, it's at least a little bit wrong. <laughs> at least a little bit wrong. <laughs> if not, mm, you read some papers and this is what they sort of thought, and you sort of hold your nose when you write it down because that's the best approximation of the truth. <laughs> but we don't teach it that way. We teach it like Moses is bringing the information down from, from, from the mount. And these are facts, and that is not the way science works. So that starts on day one. And that's why 
I got to Princeton without even thinking I could be a scientist. Because uh, I am someone who is a natural scientist. I don't believe anything. And if something is forced down my throat, I don't like it. And that's how we have to start educating kids in school, in grade school. This is, these are not facts. This is what an experiment is. We get evidence. Uh, what a textbook is, is our best guess of what the truth is. Some things, extremely solid, right? Particularly as you get more basic. Get to physics and chemistry, okay. Those are, you know, pretty close to being almost certainly true. But then as we move away towards the cutting edge, our, how definite we can be about our conclusions are much less, right? Much less. And any decent discussion, right, ha- has got to be very shaky scientifically, really, right? Have, have you read Ignorance by Stuart Firestein? I have not. You must. Yeah. All right. It is, Stuart is a professor here at mm-hmm. Columbia, and he realized at some point that all we're teaching students in his classes mm-hmm. are facts. That's right. And that's not what science is about. It is not. What we should be teaching them is ignorance. That's right. What we don't know, because he, that's his, right. his main thesis is that facts allow you to find out what you don't know. That's right. So um, he's actually going to be a guest on Twiv in a couple oh, fabulous. of weeks, because he has this book. I, I really I recommend will. you read yeah. it. You'll love it. Yeah. It t- will take you about two to three hours. It's yeah. a small book, but it's beautiful. And he, he actually t- teaches a course yeah. at Columbia called Ignorance, and he has guest people come in and tell them, Tell the students what's not known about right. their field. Fabulous. That's what every working scientist does. And so I wish, I, I mean, one of our goals with my podcast is to try and bring to a wider audience what science is. Um, and, you know, we're reaching good numbers of people, but I wish we could reach more uh, of, of, the, of the anti-science people, for mm-hmm. example, and just show them what science is and what it isn't. That's right. So we're working. One of my impressions is that um, what, we, what we have seen over years from starting when I entered science to now is a trend – and my view is that it comes from Congress where they want everything to be accountable. We give you this money. We want a result. What have you done for cancer? What have you done for heart disease, diabetes, translational emphases in research? And and that is because they don't appreciate how long it takes to get from a discovery to a practical approach. Do you think that's that's a reasonable assessment? Yeah, I'm not sure the blame is on Congress, though. Mm-hmm. I think I think we should first look to ourselves. Ourselves what? meaning scientists, scientists. Or, yeah, scientists, yeah. our leaders. What are they telling Congress? Um, because my experience in 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 trying to um, change science policy is that people on Capitol Hill are very receptive to, to scientists, and and for certainly they they understand the plight of postdoctoral fellows, right? They were really very sympathetic back then when we were trying to increase salaries, and to me, the first people we have to convince are the scientists, and that's why I show the Pogo slide that we have met the enemy and he is us. I think our first problem is to convince our leaders that this is what we should advocate for. So who are our leaders? Our leaders are the heads of societies. There are department chair. There are deans. There are president of powerful universities. There are institute directors. These are our leaders. And these are the people who have to then say, this is what we want to Congress. I don't think the problem is Congress. And Congress is not the representatives anyway. I mean, they are the ultimate decision makers. But what Congress is, from what I can see, and living in Washington and being a political junkie at this point, is a tremendous number of dedicated people, professionals, and also lots of young people who come to Washington, idealistic people who work very hard for not much money, who want to do good things for the public. Right? People have a terrible impression of the U.S. government. I do not share that opinion. To me, the U.S. government is a tremendous creation. It really is. I mean, we try to do the best we can for people. And we, we may be the worst government in the world, like Churchill said, except for all the other ones, right? That's his famous comment on democracy. And I think Congress tries to give people what they ask for. And I think we have to be careful in what we ask for. And I think we also have to educate patient advocacy groups, which is another excellent group of people. People who are interested in a specific disease, typically because a family member or a friend have it. We, we have to advocate, have to, we have to educate them that the, the path to a cure is not necessarily immediate translational research. And I think it's a very difficult thing, but I think what we have to do as a scientific society is decide what is a reasonable amount of money, amount of money to dedicate to truly translational research, which is not really research. It's more engineering in a way. Mm-hmm. We have these things we would like to try, which is then a different kind of problem, versus real research, right? It could be 
clinic-oriented research, but research in the sense we don't know what's going to work. Mm -hmm. And we need a firewall between these two so we don't keep sucking more money out of the basic. And I think to ask people working in very basic systems to start their grants by justifying what disease they're going to cure is a mistake. Uh, Because it may look good, but in the end, it really is moving the focus off of where it should be which is basic discovery. One of, my, one of my favorite TV shows of all time, it's a BBC show called Connections, mm-hmm. that when we, were, when we were in our 20s, it was on PBS, right? I forget the name of the British guy who did it. He was an ex-scientist, and he would start with some random event in Italy, Galileo dropping a ball. And he would show through a series of very random connections, but they really, really were connected. Someone read someone's paper, they met someone, mm-hmm. how this in the end wound up to change uh, how the iPod works. Right, hmm. And the point being that you make a discovery, you never know how it's going to be used. You never know what the practical ramifications are. Right? So, so things like you know, Maxwell's Laws, which were worked out yeah, in terms yeah. of radio, electric, radio magnetism in the, in the 1800s, we're still using them today in new ways. Sure. Restriction enzymes. I love many, that Many, many things. Right? People, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, politicians get up and they ridicule this or that basic research, which turns out to be the, the basis for what we understand about cancer. Right? Obviously, what we know about the cell cycle started in brewer's yeast. What we know about development starts in Drosophila. Right? And it's easy to get up and say, why aren't we funding fruit, fruit fly research? Well, that's why. Because biology is, is woven from the same thread. Right? And if you understand how one organism works, it will give you unique clues about how other ones work. That's the great thing about being a virologist for you young virologists out there. Viruses are amazing tools. And what viruses do, because they have so little genetic information and such a difficult job, is they shine a spotlight, their own little spotlight, on some important cellular pathway. And because viruses overdo it, it makes it much easier to study that pathway. So much of what we know about basic cellular processes come from studying different viruses. And sometimes viruses that themselves are not terribly medically important. A lot of what we know about how proteins get out of cells comes from studying vesicular stomatitis virus, which is causes a disease in cattle, right? And But has it been a fabulous model for so many elements of basic biology and basic evolution, right? So this is one of the great things about virology is it allows you to study any aspect of science you would like of biology, right? And they are terrific tools, terrific tools. One of the things you said to the students was you have to work on something that's fundable. You do. But you could argue that working on a virus that infects a frog in a remote region of Africa could lead to something big. You just can't it predict. Would. It would. But <laughs> we also have to be real. Okay. Then that's the problem. If it was up to me, I would encourage research into many different organisms as possible mm-hmm. because they each can tell us something new. Yeah. Right? So, for example, the Mimi viruses, they're incredible. Yeah. Who would have guessed you could have such big viruses that make their own ribosomal subunits? They have their own tRNAs. Oh, my God. They are going to tell us incredibly important things. Yeah. But until they cause a disease, right, it's going to be hard to fund them at the proper level. So you've, you've got to have this mix in science to be successful today between pragmatism and idealism. When we started, you can be an idealist. You could get money if you were good to study almost anything. Today, you got to sell it, right? You've got to show how what you're going to do is, is going to help something more immediate, and you can still do that. Even something like flu that people have been studying since 1930, 1930 when Chope first identified uh, flu in pigs, there are still so many opportunities for making basic discoveries in flu biology and also in basic cell biology and immunology, right? Because what we know is, is just a tiny fraction of what is knowable, even in flu. That is one of the best studied viruses, right? So I wish we could fund studying viruses from Equatorial Guinea. I absolutely agree with that. I, I once talked to a journalist, a science journalist, and she said any, any student should be able to become a scientist and do whatever they want in the ideal society yes. and get the money to do it. I agree. But we don't live in that world. Yeah. So to counsel kids today how to be successful, it's good to work on something that other people think is important. Let's talk a little bit about how to how to be a good scientist starting from your graduate years. You talked a lot about that today. What do you need to be to be really really good and to survive in this <clears throat> yeah. this day? Well, the first thing you need is obsession. 
you basically have to be obsessed with science to, to really mm -hmm. be successful at it. And even back then, the best people, they were basically obsessed, mm -hmm. right? People who wanted to be in the lab. And what I usually tell kids is that if you're Bill Gates's kid and you didn't have to do anything you know, to make money, what you would choose is to be a scientist. And I think for our generation, we just feel lucky that someone has paid us to do something that we love, mm -hmm. right? And for us, the hard thing is often going home at night. Right? We just love science. We love making discoveries. So I think the, the base, what you really need deep in your heart, um, and, and I, I have that Einstein slide talking to Freud, where you know what it is basically is this drive from deep in your heart that you just want to find out things. That, that is the first thing you need as a scientist. Right? Um, what does he say? The daily effort comes from no deliberate intention or program, but straight from straight the heart. Straight from the heart. Right, straight from the heart. So that's what, you know, you PhD students out there, you may not see that in your PIs now. They've been beaten down by trying to get money, and <laughs> but they still have it. It's there. The heart is there if you went deep enough. But early in their career, they definitely had that, this passion for science, this, this core love of science. And I think Mark Schalberg, in a previous TWIV, uh, Mark was a longtime colleague of mine in LVD. Mark said it extremely well when he drew the analogy with mm -hmm. one of his kids as a dancer don't even think about it unless you can't live without it right because it's just it's just too hard a career now so that's you know one of the things second today you better have good hands mm -hmm. you better be able to do experiments yourself right and what is that it's obsession it's attention to detail it's being able to think on your feet very quickly it's it's being obsessive about what's the best way to do an experiment it's it's about knowing everything that you're doing and not just taking things for granted thinking about what buffers you're using thinking about what ter detergents you're using worrying about everything but in real time so you're going to need a first rate mind to do all this stuff right you 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 got to you got to have that uh, at the end of the day you're going to have to be able to communicate with people well so you're going to have to learn how to be a good writer. I hope you've gotten that in college. Uh, but if not, you better remediate that during your PhD uh, or your postdoc. And you've got to learn how to give a good talk. In a perfect world, how you presented yourself wouldn't be that important. But in today's world, you really have to be able to give a good seminar. You get your foot in the door for getting a job by your CV, by what published you've paper, what, by what papers you've published. You get the job by going to an institution, having very good one-on-one -on -one encounters with the faculty, and by giving a very good job seminar, and where you, you illustrate your enthusiasm for science, your love of science. You show that you're thinking a big picture about science. You're not just worrying about the minutiae in your projects. You've got the big picture. Why are you studying this? Why is it important? Okay, what does these, might you actually be able to, to talk about, right? Even without that, what's the big picture? So there are... A lot of skills you need to be a successful scientist. And when you say it, it, it seems very daunting. And all I can say, and, and, and what we know as people who have, have done it, is that some people have all these skills, right? So at the end of the day, how much innate ability you have will play a role in how successful you are. And, and that's something else. At some point in your career, not too soon, you have to give yourself time to see how good you're going to be. But at some point in your career, during your PhD or even during your postdoc, you're going to have to step back and, and, and think, you know, okay, do I love it? Okay, I do. Am I good at it? Mm -hmm. Am I good at it? And don't trust your own opinion necessarily. Some people are too hard on themselves. Some people are terrific at it, but they don't have the confidence yet, which they will need. So talk to your PI. That is our job as PI. You should ask your PI, am I, am I cut for this? Yeah. What well, do you think? What do you think I should be doing? But they're not always going to be right either, right? They're not. But we have a good idea. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly once you've been a PI. A young PI will have a, won't necessarily have as good an opinion. But when you've been doing this for 10 or 20 or 30 years, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. get a pretty good idea. And the PI needs to be honest, right? Yeah. yeah. Not cruel, but honest. Yeah. And And... Oftentimes, it's actually the opposite of what people think. They really have it, and you have to tell them that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's someplace else that PIs can, can fall short. They really are not as positive as they, need, as, they, as they need to be. You know, being a negative person in life is bad every which way, hmm. every which way. And that's one of the things I, I tell kids, right, is that you always want to be as positive as possible. And I think one of the real problems now that science is so competitive is that 
we're just in this downward spiral of negativity. People have their papers rejected, people have their grants rejected, and then they're, they're overly critical of other people. They're overly critical of people in their lab. And one can overdo it by being supportive, but I think we have a lot of room yeah. right, in our careers. And I just think that people are just, you know, particularly as reviewers of grants and, and papers, they're just, they're way too critical. And they say things that, you know, even if they're right, you just shouldn't say it that way. People pour their hearts and souls into their papers and their grants. And, and one needs to be supportive, right? The point of reviewing a paper is really to try to make it a better paper, right? Not, not to impede their progress. That's right. Ability. As someone I know says, the reviewing process just serves to delay publication it does. until your competitors can. That's do right. The same. Yeah, no, that's right. You guys have talked about this at length. But this is not new. This has been in science it's worse. forever. It's, it's worse. It's worse because of the funding situation. It's worse now, Vince. I really think it's worse. It's always been around. Yeah, it, it has been. And listen, science will always be flawed because we're human beings. Yeah, exactly. That's what we're not perfect. We okay. Have, you have nine, at least nine distinct phenotypes of <laughs> PIs, and you're never going to get one. No, Which no. would be ideal. Yeah. That's yeah. never going to happen. Yeah, so right? Vince is referring to one of the great Alex Dent cartoons, which is the nine types of PIs. Yeah, it's yeah, wonderful. It is. It's one of your slides, right? Uh, it is now, but not that one. Now I, I have the 12 have types of graduate students. Yeah. I, uh, I just I put that in for this talk, actually. Okay, yeah. Because okay, yeah. I, I just would refer people to them. I thought I should show one or two. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's important to emphasize these, these qualities that make a good PI, especially for people who are going to be one one day and try yes. to avoid the mistakes people should read your article and see what's not. well and and talk to their pis and one of the one of the good trends in science now one of the one of the silver linings of the cloud that we're in mm -hmm. is that because it is so much harder to be a pi now that most institutions are assigning mentors to young pis many of whom are really very good and i think we're doing a much better job now of of trying to train young pis instead of when when it was when we were doing it you were just thrown into the pool Right. As a PI, no one gave you any advice. You just you learned by making mistakes, right? Which you can learn that way. It's but not bad. It's, it's not okay, bad. but you know it's not as efficient. Yeah. And what places are doing now? Because people don't realize you hire a young PI, it's usually about a million dollar commitment, right? Right to support them for three years before they can reasonably be expected to get their own money. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of time to go through the interviewing process. Uh, the good thing about the system in America is it's not a system in Europe where someone has to die to have a full professorship. We hire a young person. <laughs> yeah. We want them to succeed. Yeah. We're desperate to have them succeed. The job is there for them. And today, people are giving them good mentoring. right? And at NIH, uh, I think we are doing a much, much better job at that. And I know my institute, uh, we really pay attention to this. We really do. And we try to get, we try to get young people on track. I think that the Institute is doing a very good job at this. Yeah. So by the time you're ready to do a postdoc, you should have all of these qualities that you mentioned as, well, a, as a student. you know, if you're going to spend six years, you should, right? Yeah. It used to be four years. Why has it gotten longer? I don't know. Why? You tell me. You, you're, you're in the trenches. We get them as postdocs. You get them as students. It's true. Um, I don't know. My, my informal sense is that many things are harder to do. The, the, the things you think of are, are really hard projects. Usually they're not simple. And you know why? Because we think the simple things are not going to get us funded in the long run. Well, I, I think part of the problem now is we demand 48 supplemental figures for every paper. And if you look back at what a publishable unit was in 1980, it was a much smaller paper. Oh, yeah. Right? Where the points were basically just as solid, but you didn't have to have 12,000 different ways of doing something. And one of the ironies to me is that in a single experiment today, you can get more data than you and I got in our entire 20 years, first 20 years of our career. One of these array-based methods, right? Yeah. So the irony yeah. is you get huge amounts of data, and we're still demanding more and more and more. So again, I've looked at the enemy, and he is us. I think one of the problems is what we set as an acceptable standard for publishing a paper is too high. I have a friend who is uh, in charge of... of um, the students at, in, in a cell biology department, and he says one of the terrible things is that when we were students, we each got to publish a couple of papers uh, where we were generally, you know, if not the only author with our PI, then, you know, we did most of the experiments. We got to write the paper ourselves. 
Uh, and today, students, they're lucky to be on one paper, and typically there are 45 other co-authors, and maybe they haven't even written the whole paper. So the whole training experience has, has really, you know, changed. And again, I think the problem is we have confused our, our training pool with our labor pool. And because we depend on graduate students to produce the research that will get us grants, the focus is on the research and not necessarily the training. So who should do our research then? Let's say in an ideal world we could have our students training and not worry about publishing more than, say, one paper. Who would do our research? Staff scientists. Okay. Less postdocs, more staff scientists. Smaller labs collaborating more intensely with each other, I think, is a better model than what we have now. And... We should certainly just try this model at a few places anyway, and as an experiment. It'd be great if NIH could say to a certain university department, we're going to try a new model of funding, and we'll do an experiment, because we're afraid to change the entire system, because maybe it's worse. Okay? So we'll do an experiment. Are you going to have controls? <laughs> yeah, the rest of the system, we will. <laughs> and we'll have some objective measure of productivity. Not a good control. It's yeah. got to be at the same place. That's well, going to be a hard experiment. Okay. But Can that be done? Could NIH do that? I think anything is possible. I really do. You have, I, a, you have a very different view of uh, NIH and government than we do out here in the trenches. You do. You're all suspicious of government. Very and much. I know, and I don't. Ha what I see at government is a l tremendous number of dedicated people who want to do things for society. And we see a deadlock Congress that passes nothing because of partisan views. Okay, so th that it's a separate part. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is a problem that we're going to have to address as well. But I'm an American, and what I think one of the great things about Americans that Europeans make fun of us is that we have this attitude we can change things. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think being optimistic is essential in life. And if you have the attitude you can't change something, that is true. You will never change it. If you have the attitude I might be able to have a positive effect, at least you have the chance. And this is our great strength as a country is this crazy attitude, we can do things better. Okay? And when we give up that attitude, we've lost. Right? So I am fighting. I think it's a great point. That's really a good... You're right. We cannot say we can't do it. In fact, no. when we discussed the publishing issue on TWIV not too long mm -hmm. ago, we discussed the Casa de Val Fang papers mm -hmm. and all their suggestions, and we said, oh, this is too much. This will never happen. And a number of listeners got ticked off yeah. at us. They say, you have to hope that you can change things. Yes. Otherwise, you never will. Exactly. And now you're saying the same thing. Exactly. So that You have to think you can do something. Uh, I just, several times in my own career, I've seen it. I, when, I, when I got, Jack and I had many conversations with, with, with Jeff Fralinger, who was doing a, um, a mini sabbatical in our lab about the postdoc issues. And we said, okay, God damn it, we should do something about it. And we did. We had a positive impact. We helped get a big salary increase that happened around the time of the doubling. And this was just we, the three of us tilting at windmills. Okay? And in yeah. this case, Don yeah. Quixote won. And we did something. And that, I learned from that that things look impossible. You start talking about it. You start revving yourself up. You get other people involved. And you can change things. Right? And again, this is what America was brilliant at. We have just, we are a society that is very, very good at reinventing ourselves. This is why our labs are so good. Because we see authority, we rebel against it. We say, okay, we have a better idea. We're not just going to listen to what people tell us to do. Mm -hmm. Right? And we can do something better. Right? And that, we cannot abandon that spirit. It's very important. Very important. And what, uh, you know, they're always, the older generation always thinks the younger generation is worse. And when we were students, they said the same about us. But one of the people say today about the younger generation is that they are too accepting of, of the way things are, right? That they have to fight. I mean, our generation was crazy, right? And the one just before us in the 60s, right? They were crazy about changing things. And the great thing about America, it has changed enormously since we were kids. You look at what the social norms were in the 50s and where we are today. I mean, my God, it's a different world. Well, this show, Mad Men, right? Mm -hmm. Did you grow up in New York? No, New Jersey. Okay, Close well, this was, our, this was our world, right? Yeah, yeah. And you think how much it has changed, yeah. right? Just watching that show, just how people think, right? And what happened was people who were willing to buck the system changed it, mm -hmm. right? This is the American genius, is not, sati not being satisfied with what the status quo is. And it's always going to be painful. Things are never perfect. And what your job is as a generation is to change things for the better, to try to make things better. This is, this is the job. I mean, 
People who are in science, for the most part, come from a privileged background. We were all given outstanding educations, right? I mean, our, our families work hard. They sent us to good schools. Our professors educated us. What we owe back for this gift is to make things better. It's not to get richer, okay? It's to make things better. And, and this is a motivating force for almost everyone I've ever met who works in the U.S. government. Mm-hmm. And it kills me when people rip on government employees because that is not what I see. Yes, the government is getting more bureaucratic. Society is. This is something we need to fight. Every year, more rules and regulations, right, which make things more difficult, more expensive. We need to fight this. But this is not just on the people. The people are well-meaning. The people are dedicated, Right. People are so suspicious of the government, and I face this. I, I go around and say, listen, we have an idea at NIH. We can improve the system. And the first thing we get is, oh, my God, we're afraid. Mm-mm. If the government is doing it, it must be bad. Why, why are intramural people interested in this? What, how are you going to line your, your nest? How are you going to feather your nest better? Th- there's none of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right? What we see at NIH is, is we see this is a great system that we have, people of my cadre, the generation before me. We love NIH. This has been an extremely supportive environment for us. Uh, I think tremendous scientists has come out of NIH. And then we see our colleagues and our, our students and our postdocs who go into the real world. Uh, and it's difficult. And many of them struggle when they should not be struggling because the system is really not an optimal system. And we look at our system, we say, this is a damn good system. And people say, you know, NIH, we, you should have our system. And I look at that and go, no, 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 you got it backwards. You should have our system. Mm. This is a better system. You will be much happier. And, and yes... Y- You have to really work hard to make sure that it isn't an old boy network. And you're not just funding people because you're friends with them. You really have to have rigorous peer review. And one of the criticisms of the intramural system, until about 1990, was there there really wasn't much peer review. And and I think starting around then, uh, the peer review got much more rigorous. And, And today, I think it's pretty good, actually. And I would say damn good in my institute. I mean... People come up for review, and they are very nervous and worried because the standards are high. And, and this is what is required. So I really think that we're doing it right now at NIH, and I think this really can be a model for the rest of the country for how we should do science. It's just a huge advantage towards retrospect in retrospective review. Well, hopefully this message will get out because, as I said, us here in the trenches don't have this uh, view that you have of, of NIH and, and government and it, it sounds like you might have... Uh, but here's the thing, Vince, is that yeah. you're all working for the government anyway. The government is basically paying everybody's salary. More or less, yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's just your de facto government employees, right? So my original idea was actually to extramuralize the NIH system and make Vince mm-hmm. Rankin Yellow a federal employee who happens to work at Columbia, right. like we have people at the VA here. Right. Right. That had a support of one, which was me. Okay. And no one wanted that, okay. right? So people were really suspicious of that, and I can understand why. Okay. Right? But a hybrid then, right? Where we're going, and there have been grants in the past that were retrospective. NCI had a very successful program for about 10 years in the 90s mm-hmm. where they were retrofunding people, i.e. funding people based on their accomplishments. And I think people were very happy, and I think by and large it was a successful program. Right? And I think NCI is looking at that and thinking about whether they could re-implement that. Right? And again, one of the things I hope to accomplish with this TWIV is if, li- if listeners support this, uh, to contact me, to contact other people at NIH and say, listen, we really think you should seriously consider this kind of program. Right? And we're willing to shrink our labs for the very, for the very successful people. We're willing to shrink our labs to have less people if we, if we know we're going to be judged retrospectively and we're going to have a more steady supply of money. Mm-hmm. Right? I, I know lots of friends who are extremely successful in the extramural lab, and they, they've always told me they need at least one extra grant because it's very difficult if you're just running on what you need. Because if you don't get a grant, even if you're going to get it, you don't want to fire all your people who are on that grant. And so if you need two R01s, you have three. Right? And let's just fund people at, at a level they need, but, but give them a reasonable assurance that if they are productive, that they will continue. I'm surprised to hear that within NIH there are such conversations because I'm on study section. Right. And I hear from the people involved with those, oh, we don't know what to do to make 
funding better and we have this seven percent tile mm-hmm. cut off and it's going to get worse and we need ideas from from you so please send them to us. well these you know so the government is not monolithic and intramural and extra you're, you're of course as mark was explaining to you you're much closer to extramural than the intramural people are. When you're an intramural, you don't know anything about the extramural world, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? So we are trying to work within the institutes, right? There's a, there's a guy uh, uh, called Rob Starr, who's in on IDTK, who's a, a scientist administrator, who's a terrific guy, who's got a foot in both camps, who's really been a major player mm-hmm. in trying to establish this sort of award. Uh, his name is Rob Starr. And um, so... It is sort of percolating between these two camps now. And we are looking for, for allies from the extramural world to, to push this. I mean, it's difficult to do anything new. It of really course. is. Because you've got <laughs> people who are successful under the established system who are loath to give up their existing support. Right? And anytime you start moving money around, universities get very nervous. Right? Are they going to sure. be cut out of it? Sure. Of course. Unfortunately, so, they've come to, de- to depend too much on NIH money, and that's not how it was originally meant to be. It, it's right. And, and you know, I think part of the solution is that the universities have to start kicking into the pot as well. They have to support salaries or some form of research support so that NIH doesn't have to take the whole. Uh, a- absolutely. Role. So right. this, this is happening now gradually. NIH has instituted a cap on salaries right. that in many high-cost cities is less than what uh, can support a, a full professor. Right. So this is starting in, and certainly I, I think we can discuss gradually phasing in a time when universities um, um, pay for 50% of someone's salary at least. Should be. Yeah. I mean, it can't happen overnight because it can't. they don't have the money. No, they don't have the money. They have to, and they can't put up new buildings with the expectation that NIH is going to pay for the That's salaries right. of everybody. But m- my understanding is there are places like Princeton that are not medical schools, very serious scientific establishments where they do guarantee the the salaries of their faculty. And they don't demand that they get 90, 100% of their salary from NIH. They give them nine-month salaries. Okay. Because they Uh, uh, they teach and then they have to raise three months on their own, which is fine. That's a good model. We we don't have that here. No, I know. (laughs) I think we have six-month salaries for tenured faculty. Some places have zero-month salary. Yes, of course, of course. That's right. So, you know, I think these are steps in the right direction. Well, maybe because it's, it's reached the crisis point now that change can happen. Right. I hope so. Anyway, but people should contact you, as we said earlier, if they want to help. And I, I wasn't aware that there's a there are people like you who would like to fix what's wrong outside. Because one would say, well, why do you care? You're a intramural researcher. You're doing fine. What do you care about ha- what happens outside to the extramural people? Okay. I care because I started thinking in the last five years, uh, once I passed, uh, when I got into my 50s, what is my most important job as a scientist? Mm-hmm. Okay, and what I realized, my most important job is to pass the torch of science to the next generation. Okay, if we don't do that, we're failures, no matter what we discover, because science is a precious thing. It's a flame that can it be extinguished. We've seen it in history; it's been extinguished. So that's my most important job. Okay, how do we pass the torch? We have to have a system where the flame can burn. And if we have a system where the best people are repelled or it's so capricious that you just lose your career, that is not a system I want my children to have a career in. One of my kids happens to be a scientist, right, despite mm-hmm. everything I've ever told him, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's a, a graduate student at Stanford. He's great. I hope he has a terrific career, but I see that the barriers for him are much higher than they were for me, and I want to mm-hmm. change that. And I look at intramural, I look at my career, and again, I was an extramural investigator. I, I'm not mm-hmm. someone who was only raised in the NIH system. I think we have a great system. I want to export that to the world. And what I am here is a citizen scientist. I really am. I'm trying to be an idealist. Yes, I have a perfectly fine career. I have a terrific lab. We have great people in the lab. I, I love just doing the science. One of the luxuries I have at NIH is I can have this as an alternative career, because I don't have to raise the money. I don't have to teach, right? I, I can sure. spend, I have, uh, I have a few hours a week to do this. And, and that's enough. I mean, how do you have time to do TWIV? Why do you do it? You don't get paid for it. it. You do it because of your love of science. And I think this is an incredible thing that you and, and your colleagues are doing. I think it's just terrific. And why are they doing it? Why am I doing it? Because we love science. And we want to pass the torch. Okay. For sure. This is why we do it. 
Right. And, and cynics out there will go, oh, they must have an ulterior motive. There, there is no ulterior motive. No ulterior motive. One of the things I say to the kids during the talk is trying to be a famous scientist is a futile exercise. It's just completely stupid. Right? There is no such thing <laughs> as a famous scientist, okay? We're not doing it for the fame. We're not doing it for the money. Most of us are motivated by love of science. You know, we get this bug. We get it as an undergraduate often. We do an experiment. We, we, we get a result. We love it. And we realize that this is our religion. Most of us are not religious people in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. Our religion is science, right? Our human mind obviously has a place for something deeply spiritual. Our deeply spiritual aspect is science. This is what turns us on, right? And this is where we can bring our religious fervor. Yeah, I agree. You'll be able to find this episode and all the others on iTunes, at twiv.tv and microworld.org slash twiv. And if you're new to This Week in Virology, go over to iTunes and subscribe and leave a comment or a rating there that helps us to stay really prominent and get more people uh, listening to us, which is what we want to spread the world the word about this wonderful field of science called virology. If you have any questions or comments, send them to twiv at twiv.tv. John Udell is at NIAID. Thank you so much for speaking time. as a private citizen. Speaking as a private <laughs> citizen. And someday we will come back to you and we can talk about science. Yes. Would you like to do that? I'd love to. I bet you would. Absolutely. But I think this was important to do. Thank and, you for uh, the, uh, for the uh, bully pulpit. Anytime. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. And I hope you get some, some people writing to you. And, yeah. Well, some, you know, there'll be some irate letters as well. It's okay. We, we, we want both. That's right. Uh, Debate is good. It always is good. That's uh, right. But anyway, thanks for stopping by. I've kept you enough here. And uh, tomorrow you're talking science at Mount Sinai. Science at right? a great place, Mount Sinai. Uh, ben Tenover is my host and uh, terrific young scientist. Uh, Adolfo, um, Christina Sastre is there. It is a, just a fabulous place doing terrific things in virology. Yeah. The Center yeah. for Flu Research now in the world, basically sure you have a great time uh, it'll be a blast and we'll have you back maybe when i visit uh nih please we'll do a twiv from Absolutely. there from the hub of this the government science <laughs> i'm vincent Yellow. you can find me at virology.ws you've been listening to this week in virology thanks for joining us we'll be back next week another twiv is viral <laughs>